technology, society, the way we live, the way we move. Change is accelerating. So are we. Forestia and Hella, two global automotive leaders together, stronger, creating Forvia. For better ways to move around via electrified mobility, sustainable materials and innovative zero emission solutions. For a safer, connected and customized journey via immersive cockpits, digital and autonomous driving breakthroughs. For the communities we serve and future generations via our strong awareness of mobility's impact on mankind. 150,000 people across the globe with the bold mindset, methods and energy to change mobility for millions. We are united in one vision because mobility is at the heart of people's life and of what matters to them. Moving freely, caring for the planet their own way. We pioneer technology for mobility experiences that matter to people. Carrying this mission, we inspire to let the world keep moving. Forvia, inspiring mobility. Hello, I would like to uh, wish you a nice uh, uh, welcome to, uh, to this conference. And uh, of course, uh, it's I think uh, appropriate and uh, excellent new year 2023. I will tell you a little bit about what I think about this new um, uh, journey. Um, I also would like to um, welcome all the people who are connected, and I think we have more than 350 people connected now, 400. It's, uh, it's increasing, so a very warm welcome uh, to you. You know, it's the first time that um, uh, we will, uh, I will present uh, for the year at, uh, at the CES. Uh, we um, uh, closed this deal in uh, early uh, February of uh, 2022, and so I, I would like to tell you a few things about presenting, introducing uh, for VIA to you. The last time we were in the CES, uh, Forestia made a uh, sales of uh, 16 billion euros. In 2022, we will be close to 25 billion euros, and in 2025, uh, with uh, you know, the majority of uh, the programs being already awarded, we will be at 30 billion euro. And we will, we will be, we are uh, currently a uh, sustainable and a tech company focused on uh, the automotive uh, business. And the size counts. And I will um, you know, tell you a little bit more about why it is so important and why we have made this, um, this deal. But first, a few figures. We are the seventh largest automotive supplier worldwide. One out of two vehicles are equipped with uh, at least one part or one subsystem coming from Fovia. We have six business groups and we have the vast majority of the worldwide OEMs as customers. We are very much innovation focused and this will be a significant part of uh, the presentation of today in, uh, in innovation. So we have 77 R&D centers globally. We spend more than 8% of our sales on R&D. We have 14,000 patents and we have 15,000 engineers out of which between 3,500 and 4,000 software uh, engineers. We are working in 42 countries and we have 150,000 uh, uh, colleagues around the world. We are focused on three domains, three major domains. Electrification and energy management, safe and automated driving, digital and sustainable cockpit experiences. And you will see that these domains are the fast growing mega trends of the automotive industry. Why is it important to, um, to be big? The first thing is in this uncertain world, and it is uncertain and it will last for a much longer period of time, you need to mitigate the risks. And how do you mitigate the risks in the automotive industry? First, in having the right activities, 
different activities with leading positions related to the megatrends. The second is an enlarged customer portfolio. More than 80 uh, customers, more than 80 OEMs worldwide. You see here that um, on electrification and energy management, we are on an activity which is a very fast growing activity with more than 40% sorry, 30% CAGR between 21 and 25. When you take safe automated driving, it's uh, an excess of 25% growth. And when you take uh, cockpit electronics, it's more than 10%. What is also important is the geographies. We are strong in Asia, but not only. We have a very well balanced portfolio, but Asia is significant. You see, in 2025, Asia will represent 56% of the global volumes, the global production volumes worldwide, out of which 60% will be produced in China. So you might think about some difficulties, yes, perhaps, but compared to saturated markets or mature markets, depends how uh, you want to call them, Europe and America, the potential of growth is there. The second, the, the other point, sorry, is, uh, can you, can you go, come back one slide? The second part is the segments, the vehicle segments. The premium segments and the SUVs are the growing segments. In relative terms, compared to the technologies we just spoke about, it's relatively less, but nevertheless, it's important. It's where you are creating value because the content per vehicle is significantly higher than on the other segments. The premium market especially is the innovative part of the automotive uh, industry, where customers can afford new technologies. And especially when you think about automated driving, uh, it's the case, but not only. And finally, the customers. And here, what is important is to have a balanced portfolio. And our target is not to make more than 20% of our sales with one single customer. Currently, we are at 22% with one of them. So we are on track to achieve in 2025 the target to be below 20%. This is also important because then you have the means, you have the resources to tackle complexities on one side and they are growing all the time and innovations, the investments we have to make in innovations which are also contributing to have an interdependence with uh, the OEMs. And this interdependence is growing and has started 15 years ago about and is still valid and is still expanding. You know, in all these uncertainties I spoke about, and 2023 is one of them, you know, 2023 is very specific from my point of view because you have two potential scenarios which are very far from each other. Both are related to what might happen in Ukraine. You have one which is extremely positive, where the war is uh, ending, where inflation is uh, getting reduced, where uh, the market is restarting. It looks good and it's possible. But you have also another one, which is by far darker and which is corresponding to some extreme situations which uh, might exist again related to this, uh, to this war. And so we don't know where the, the reality in 2023 will be. And the only thing we can do is to get ready on whatever the scenario might be. In all these uncertainties, one thing is certain. It's the concern the world has on climate change. And we are working on this for many years now, and especially on the scope one and two. And we were very glad to have started um, four years ago in reducing our consumption of energy. 
We will be, in, we will be able in 2023 versus 2021 to save between 25% and 30% of energy consumption. On the top of that, we will be self-producing more than 7% of uh, our energy needs. And we are continuing. We are continuing to invest uh, to make sure that uh, we uh, uh, will uh, get supplied by green energy everywhere around the world. We also have to tackle the scope three. And the scope three means for the automotive industry new architectures, new ways to design uh, our parts, new materials. The materials have to be recyclable. Um, they, have to be, they have to contribute to, uh, and to the circular economy, which will, de which will develop significantly in the years to come, and which will allow us also to enter in an B2C business much more than we were so far able to do through the independent aftermarket. The target we have, validated by SBTI, science-based targets, is zero, net zero in 2045. We were the first automotive company getting this validation. It was in June 2022. And I think that in the moment we are about 20 companies worldwide having achieved this um, level. It's very, very important because, you know, you have to be very precise in, our, in your convergence curves, how to manage this properly. And we have intermediate uh, targets uh, to, uh, to uh, make this happen. In 2022, we have uh, created Materiact. Materiact is a division of um, Forvia uh, in which we are developing new materials, green materials. And our legitimacy is coming from our knowledge about how these materials are getting transformed. If you do compounds, formulations, where you are mixing up virgin material with recycled material and maybe even with biosourced materials, you are increasing structurally um, the viability of your material compound. First, you need to understand what this, what this uh, viability is, which is not so easy. And then you have to make sure that, considering the transformation process, you will be able to compensate this additional viability through a reduced process viability. And this is what we are doing on foils, not only, but also on uh, resins for uh, the automotive industry. And you see we are considering more than 2 billion euros of sales in uh, 2030. And we have already sales, yeah? so we are not starting from from zero, and what is extremely important is to define your ecosystem now, because we have to make sure that the feedstock will be made available in large volumes, which are the ones which are needed in the automotive uh, industry. The mission, you know, we worked on Fovia's mission when we, uh, you know, combined our our group. So. Usually, you know, in the mission, there's nothing very uh, fancy or very differentiating, but I think that we have found something. We pioneer technology for mobility experiences that matter to people. And I think the that matter to people is the most important sentence in, um, in this mission. We have to make mobility affordable. In democracies, mobility is key. It's a right, the right of freedom, of mobility freedom. This right is in danger with electrification. We don't know how to make small cars affordable with batteries. China knows it. The Delta price currently is exceeding 10,000 euros between smaller vehicles produced in Europe and equivalent vehicles produced in China. The difference might be a little bit less when these uh, OEMs will have to accept and to uh, 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 comply with uh, European or American regulations, 
but I believe that the delta will be uh, still very significant around the um, uh, 8,000 euros. So for us, it's absolutely critical. Innovation is a must. Um, we have to adapt to this new world, but it has to be affordable. And we cannot continue to inflate the vehicles and the mobility. We have to find solutions which will allow uh, and uh, mobility access to um, the vast majority of uh, people. I'm not alone today um, making this presentation. I would like to uh, welcome uh, Thierry Renan. Thierry is professor at Ecole Polytechnique. Ecole Polytechnique in France is the best engineering school. And uh, Thierry is making research in business models and also how innovation might be uh, uh, organized and, and how, you know, be effective on innovation. So Thierry, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patrick. Hello, everyone. My best, my, my best wishes for, uh, for 2023. Um, and really, thank you, Patrick, for, uh, for inviting me here to uh, share the work we've started on uh, sustainable mobility. Um, so, as Patrick mentioned, I'm a professor of innovation management at Ecole Polytechnique. Not sure many of you know Ecole Polytechnique, aside if you were following the uh, awards of the Nobel Prizes. We had two in physics over the past four years. Basically, Polytechnique is often dubbed as the French MIT, though technically it should be the other way around because uh, Polytechnique is 20, 227 years old and actually Boston Tech was created on the model of the, uh, of the Ecole Polytechnique. Um, I'm very glad to be here because I think that uh, it's quite unusual. So thank you again, Patrick, to have uh, academics, researchers like me coming up and speaking at the CES during one of these press conferences. But uh, without being overly dramatic, we know that uh, the situation is dire and that the challenge that humanity has to address in relation to climate change is probably one of its toughest challenges. And that is very well illustrated in the case of mobility. I mean, nowadays you can't utter the word mobility without at the same time thinking of uh, climate change and sustainability. This is good, but this is probably where one of the problem is, is that climate emergency has led us to focus chiefly on one on the aspect of sustainability which is the environment whereas we know that sustainability requires strong alliances between environment society and the economy and if we don't have these three things at the same time then basically this is not sustainable and in the case of mobility, of course, we know that mobility, whether cars or airplanes, for instance, have been highly detrimental for the environment. But at the same time, they have been overwhelmingly positive for the society and the economy. I mean, Patrick described mobility as a fundamental right. And it's fair to say that mobility is important. In fact, you could argue that the the least people are wealthy and the more they actually need mobility, uh, this is a fact. And nowadays, in order to achieve even the least ambitious environmental targets, we are facing a situation where we would have to dramatically decrease mobility. Of course, that should be good for the environment, but that would mean a significant social and economic burden. And this is where the matter is. People are willing, understand that we need to do something for climate change, but if it comes at a social cost which is too huge, at an economic cost that is too huge, they're simply going to refuse to help and we'll be back square one. People need the environment, but people also need mobility. And this is why we have to reinvent mobility. In fact, what we need is find new forms of mobility that are such that they do have the expected environmental impact, but at the same time also have a positive 
social and economic impact. That looks like an impossible equation. So how do we do that? Well, we're at CES, right? So you'll tell me, hmm, easy, technology. Right, okay. So of course, technology is part of the equation. And as we can see, uh, the technological developments surrounding um, uh, electrical vehicles, hydrogen, AI, autonomous vehicle, are ways indeed to achieve some targets. But technology is not the solution, you know. I mean, we actually are aware of plenty of situations where actually instead of being te the solution, technology is part of the problem. And the issue is that when it comes to technology, we have to figure out what mobility and what sustainable mobility will look like. And this is a problem because that's mobility nowadays, but we simply don't know what mobility tomorrow will look like. Is it really about taking every single of these uh, cars and replacing the petrol-based engine by uh, electrical engine or a fuel cell? Probably not. It, it needs to go further than that. And in fact, if we look at what has been happening in regard to mobility over the past 10 years, some very interesting things have been happening. And we've been seeing new forms of mobility arising, plenty of new forms. But from uh, an innovation um, researcher perspective, what gets really interesting is that we don't have a dominant design. Usually you get different types of prototypes of cars and bicycles, and then you come up with one dominant design for, for wheel and the steering wheel. But we can see that there are new forms of mobilities that have emerged and that do coexist. And it's not just that people, different people will use different form of mobilities, it's just that actual people use at the same time different forms of mobility. So when it comes to inventing sustainable mobility, we're not in a situation where one size fits all. It's not everyone getting a car or everyone getting on the airplane and so on and so forth. We have to find sustainable mobility means finding ways to be efficient in terms of mobility. And that means very different ways to do mobility. After all, if you think about it, we have been using standardized mobility for, you know, hundred of years, but there is no reason for that. I mean, if you think of needs of mobility across continents, across countries, they have no reason to be the same. But even within the same cities, even within the same households, we all have different reason, different motives and different needs related to mobility. And yet, we all use the same devices, cars typically. And this is what the problem is. So for, to overcome that issue, to find ways to invent sustainable mobility, we do need technology, but not just any technology, as Patrick mentioned it. We need technology that matters to people, and technology that matters to people is technology that is sought with people, not just for people, but technology that is invented, developed, with people. And I think automobile is a very good example of that. I mean, of course, we know that automobile has been highly detrimental for the environment, but at the same time has been usually positive for society and the economy. But nowadays, automobile has become a liability. Okay. And we are in a situation where we have, in a matter of years, to swap millions of dirty cars to replace them with clean cars. And this is a massive burden. Of course, they cost more. I mean, it's an economic burden. Some people are excluded from mobility. This is a social burden. But it's also an environmental burden. I and mean, what are we going to do with all that? We have millions of cars which are perfectly usable, which are just going to be sitting there. This is not very 
you know, circular. Okay. And if one thing, climate change has shown us that, well, shown us, uh, reminded us, we should know about it, but we tend to forget about it, that we live in a world of limited resources. In a world of unlimited resources, we would just do like, and you know, all the dirty cars would be replaced by you know, green cars and that would be it. But we live in a world of limited resources and that means we need to turn automobile the way it exists, the stock of vehicles we have into assets. It's not just about swiping, it's not just about replacing. So how do we do that? Well, we already know about that. For example, what do you do when your house doesn't fit your needs anymore because your family grew or because it's not well insulated against the cold or the heat? Well, typically you don't do that, right? You would rather do something that looks like that, okay? So, you know, when your home is not fit for purpose anymore, you tend to refurbish it, okay? And it is exactly something we'll have to do when it comes to automobile. Sustainability is really making the most of limited resources. And that means that sustainable mobility means leveraging all the resources that are available to transport them. And that means taking automobile or other forms of transportation and making means to improve environment, society, and the economy. But how do we do that? I mean, again, it's not just about taking old car and retrofitting fuel cell into that. It depends. In some cases, that might be the right solution. In others, it's not. So for that to happen, to invent sustainable mobility, we have to rely on people because people know what they need. And technology that matters to people is indeed technology with people. How do we involve people? Well, the good news is that people tend to involve themselves. I mean, my research has been about investigating how digital technologies have led us to, to shift from a world where companies and businesses were doing the creation, the design, the manufacturing, the distribution, and the communication to a world where actually people are able to create and to design and replicate and communicate and so on and so forth. Basically, digital technologies have changed us, transformed us from passive consumers to prosumers, meaning people who, when they consume, are active in the production process. And this has had absolutely marvelous consequences. I mean, Think of in the 2000s, in the content industry, people started to make news, whether true or fake, um, and started to create a collective encyclopedia. And then through the sharing economy, we started to swap services with one another, taking people from A to B, renting couch or rooms, all the things that typically businesses were doing. And this is already happening in the realm of objects through 3D printing, for example. And who could have thought that we would be able to harness our own energy? So basically, this is already happening. And if we want to devise sustainable mobility, we just have to leverage that. And leverage that is leveraging another aspect of my research, which is user innovation. And users are very good when it comes to innovation if you give them the right tools. Even in the case of automobile, if you look online, you'd find that actually people have made amazing things that enable them to extend the lifespan of their cars, to make them better, more efficient, or to transfer them, to adapt them to their needs. This is already something which is happening. The issue of all that is that users are not able to scale up. If I find a good solution for my car, then how am I going to make that available to millions of people? The mobility of tomorrow requires an alliance between people and the industry. This is the only way this can work. Otherwise, whatever innovation people have in mind, whatever solution, they cannot scale up, and the industry, without the vision of people, cannot devise the right mobility. So this is how 
we get sustainable mobility, and sustainable mobility means climate-aware, need-driven mobility that leverages existing resources. But that requires manufacturing skills and the ability to devise new relevant technologies that will enable to deliver people's vision. That's when technology matters, when it makes it possible to deliver people's vision. So this ability to reconfigure and deliver new technologies, uh, this is something that is usually closely linked with startups. And it's true that in the case of sustainable mobility, involving startups is something which is absolutely critical. Incidentally, many of those startups were created by users who, frustrated by the lack of you know, adequate mobility, find ways to design new mobility. Um, and that means industry players have to collaborate more with startups, but also create their own startups. Part of the work I do is on corporate entrepreneurship and how companies create inside startups in order to find new ways to solve problems. And another key aspect, of course, is the ability to include people in the innovation process and to leverage user communities. Whatever happened, we have plenty of resources available to invent sustainable mobility. But for sustainable mobility to happen, for startups and people and users to deliver, to deliver their vision, we need someone to make it happen. We need the industry leaders to make it happen. Without them, we cannot make it happen. So thank you in advance, Patrick, for helping us. Thank you, Thierry. You know, I, I like um, the comparison with uh, the housing business model. Because finally, uh, why should our mobility assets be depreciated at this speed? There's no reason, especially when you go for electric uh, vehicles, battery electric or fuel cell uh, electric, all the maintenance of these vehicles will be much simpler. They, they might even, you know, be predictive. We have now diagnostic tools which can make the diagnostic while the car is running. If you keep the car much longer, then maybe your use cases will change. Yeah? And, uh, and it will be important for you to adapt the interior, as an example, to your use cases. And this is the B2C business I, I spoke about. What we also see is when it comes to innovation, we were used in the automotive industry to work on product and process innovation and not on business model innovation. And, and I think that this is also a need. We need to do it now simultaneously. We have to reinvent what it means and how it matters to people. So, about climate insight, and I think Thierry uh, has explained it very well on, on how we want to deal with this. Um, we have to care for the planet. And you see here, and I will not repeat it again, we have clear targets, we are focused on that. It's a conviction. We believe that this is one of the key challenges for humanity. There's no time to, uh, to lose. We have to work on it immediately. It's our responsibility also versus uh, the next generations. Design for the planet, we cannot continue to do what we did in the last years. New architecture, uh, circular economy, recycling uh, possibilities, and so on. Zero emissions, very clearly. So we are working on uh, battery electric vehicles, and we are working also on fuel cell uh, electric uh, vehicles, uh, because I think that both um, are you know, the alternatives we have to zero emissions. We speak about innovation, and I said it before, one of the advantages a big group has is to be able to invest in innovation. But there are several types of, uh, of innovation, and you have to combine uh, all of them. You have to get focused on CO2. We just uh, uh, spoke about this, and with all the new ideas which are uh, related to that. So sustainable innovation is a must. You have to work with startups. 
But when it comes to startups, as far as Forvia is concerned, we are considering first the scientific content of the startup. More the scientific content than the capacity to translate it into software. This is, you know, the investment we want to make in this science. Because we can combine this science or sciences with some other strengths we have inside of the company. We need an innovation ecosystem. It's very clear that nobody can do it alone. Yeah? So we work with academics, we work with uh, the startups, we work with uh, research partners, we work with tier ones uh, in, uh, in very close uh, uh, partnerships in order to save money and to uh, accelerate uh, the time to market. And um, of course, all of that without electronics and software doesn't work, so software is an absolute must today, and you need to enhance as much as possible your software capabilities. But we spoke about communities, and I think that this is the, the, the interesting item. So we, and it's an announcement I would like to make today to you, we will launch innovation through communities. Several communities, including, for example, handicapped people. With them, related to the interior of the vehicle, using our knowledge and our experience on cockpit of the future. We would like to ask them to tell us what are their good ideas. We will assess these ideas. We will do proof of concepts and we will scale up the best of these ideas and of course we will reward the people who had the idea. But we will look, do this with them to better understand what counts for them, what matters to uh, people. So we will uh, launch a website where the people will be able to connect. We will engage with different communities, existing communities. We will train them so that they understand the tools which will allow us a um, uh, uh, quick and fluid communication. And we will put together with them an assessment uh, process of their innovations. And I think that this is new and this is now closing the loop yeah, um, of um, all the different innovation processes we have and we have implemented. And we very much believe that this will be a significant booster and in its innovation with people. So, but we are at the CES, and so we have a booth here um, with uh, a lot of uh, innovations we uh, would, uh, would like to present to you. We have three masterpieces, this is one of them, where you have everything combined, you know, you have uh, the interior, the architecture, the new architecture, the new materials um, with a very low CO2 content. You have the electronics, all the HMI, the, uh, the uh, entertainment. Uh, you have the lighting for the safety aspect uh, of, um, of uh, the vehicles. That's an interesting piece um, you, uh, you will be able to see. We have two others, one especially uh, dedicated also to uh, zero emissions, uh, where you have you know, the combination between BEVs and fuel cell EVs, because I, th I think that this hybrid solution is probably uh, a solution for very specific segments like SUVs in, uh, in, in the US. On the top of that, we have 13 and 16 short, or 16 is I think in the total, with 13 uh, short experiences where we have demonstrators which are allowing you to, to see, you know, very concretely to test the innovations we are bringing in different domains. Uh, for example, in X by wire, so we have, you know, the, uh, the brake uh, by wire, we have uh, um, the steering wheel by wire, we have all these elements which are absolutely necessary for the autonomous uh, driving. We have uh, uh, very flat lights, real lights, but we have also very small headlines and integration of these ones. We are uh, exposing digital panels, which is, you know, 
uh, the next uh, elements of communication of our OEMs, you know, where they will identify themselves uh, on very large panels, which will be animated, yeah, uh, which will integrate the, the headlightings, but not only, all the radars and other uh, components which are needed will be integrated in, in these ones. And you will see also very concretely how, um, with modules, we are dealing with the interior and with the capacity uh, to make it recyclable, much more than today, but also to make it circular with uh, the possibility to upgrade it uh, as much as uh, you, uh, you want. You have here an, uh, where you can load um, the press um, uh, releases. Uh, I think it's very complete, you will see it's very detailed. So if you want to do it, you can uh, take it uh, here from here. So I would like to thank you very much for your presence, for your attention. And now we are open to answer your questions. Thank you. Can you confirm when you talked about the 10,000 euro delta, are you referring to um, cars overall or specifically EVs? So that's uh, my first question. And the second question on the sale of uh, Symbiol, does that mean you have a different strategy on the fuel cell side? Or what is your latest expectations of where that volumes will take place? What vehicle segments? Thank you. The, the price difference uh, is related to electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles. In Europe, uh, you will not find a vehicle below 20,000 euros. In China, uh, urban vehicles with 200, 250 kilometers of autonomy, you can buy them for 8,000 to 10,000 euros. That's made in China, but I think it's close to 20. Euros. So that's the Chinese today have started uh, selling the vehicles in Europe because they are more adapted to the European markets. The segmentation is uh, uh, equivalent. Uh, and they have started with higher range vehicles, and especially on uh, the rental car industry uh, because of the not availability of their uh, uh, vehicles bought by their traditional OEMs. So it starts, it, it, they are existing, these vehicles. They are good vehicles. They are affordable vehicles. And Europe will not be able to stop imports. The Germans are making an excess of 50% of their profit through their sales in China. Okay? So inside the European community, they will not be able to find a consensus to reduce imports coming from China. And on the top of that, why should they do this if there is no alternative? Because people will want these cars. They have these mobility needs. And if we are not capable to provide them, why uh, should we avoid uh, selling uh, these existing Chinese vehicles? Before the Ukrainian war, the energy content for a battery had a relative weight between 5 to 10 percent. Today, it's 25 percent. Now, when you take the materials, the metals, they are coming from China. If they are not extracted in China, they are, in the vast majority, refined in China, okay? So it will be difficult, very difficult, if at least um, the, um, the energy costs will stay at a high level to be competitive producing uh, these uh, uh, batteries in, uh, in Europe. And on the top of that, and, uh, and here we'll just repeat what Carlos Tavares said recently, and I think that this is very relevant. He said that um, to produce electricity, 
have new sources of electricity, it takes 20 to 25 years. To put in place and relevant infrastructure, loading infrastructure, takes between 10 to 15 years. Produce electric vehicles, it's not very difficult. It takes five years. What have we done in Europe? We have started through regulations to impose electric vehicles as the solution. But we are late in the infrastructure and we are late in the electricity production. And when you look at China, they have done it in the right order. And America is in between. Yeah? They are not imposing it through regulations, but they are incentivizing innovation so that it might work. And when we think about fuel cell electric vehicles, yeah, which is very much adapted to high power, so the SUVs, for example, the light trucks in America, um, the US might become the leading region on fuel cell electric vehicles in the next years. And it will start in 2025. You will see the first pickup trucks uh, on the road in 2025. Now the point will be to make hydrogen available at uh, affordable costs, which are between three to four dollars per kilogram. And then you have an appropriate uh, system. You can also mix, you know, which we are doing on uh, uh, light commercial vehicles in Europe, where we have a battery and we have a fuel cell system. We have both. Yeah? And we have both in the same packaging. And so the, the customer can adapt it. And I think that this again is um, a an, an very flexible uh, alternative to uh, uh, the battery electric vehicles for the light trucks they are too heavy and, um, and they are too big. Yeah? So it takes too much uh, uh, volumes. Any other question? Yes, uh, thank you, Michael Knau from Automobil in Germany. Um, the, the new transport uh, mobilities you presented, Professor Reiner, uh, will you, uh, Mr. Koller from Forvia, produce such uh, engines in the near future? Um, you have invited um, this smart professor to <laughs> expose his ideas uh, in, in uh, in America, where we all know the big trucks are still running for, for, for decades. Um, but will you probably start in Europe to, off to, to produce or to offer parts of those new mobility devices? The answer is yes. And I think that this is exactly what Thierry said. I think the people know that what they want or, or they know what their use cases are and uh, um, how they should be organized. But they cannot scale up. They have no possibility to scale them up. Okay. So um, that's our role. Our role is to uh, be able to um, tune, maybe, and to industrialize these ideas. Yeah? And you know, we, we, we've made the experience with a small group of people, and it's amazing the ideas they are coming up with, because they are using the vehicles every day. Yeah? So after that, we need to understand how we are dealing with this when it comes to something which is less physical. For example, um, HMI. We don't have the mouse in the car, yeah, or the equivalent. And HMI is still complex in a vehicle. So maybe we will here also have some good ideas uh, to um, make an IVI um, more easy to use and more friendly. But we have, Thierry, you, you, uh, when we had these discussions, um, you uh, told us about Dacia. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, there, there are already quite a few uh, in the communities surrounding some uh, uh, companies, and Dacia uh, being one of them. I mean, the point is people, you know, people who need mobility tend to engage with their cars and tend to make sure that 
they actually last longer and they are better suited for the need. I mean, but you can see that in the US. I mean, I think the most visible part of it is tuning, you know, these kinds of, you know, like how do you make your car look more fancy? But if you leave tuning aside, it's amazing what people do actually uh, inside their cars. I mean, sometimes it's not for necessary very, um, um, say, um, urgent or, you know, I mean, I remember there was one user who created um, a, a dock for a Nespresso machine in their car, so that's probably not the most of your things, but people that are using uh, technologies to actually really rethink the, uh, the boot of their car, how to put their tools if they, for example, use their car to work. Um, and again, the idea that we are in a situation where resources are rare. If we try to find one size fits all, we're going to end up with vehicles which have ultra large batteries. We're going to be very heavy and being used just by one person on the road. This is, we can't afford that. So we need to find solution, and I really believe, and you know, evidence has shown that people are very clever ideas, uh, but we need someone to make it happen and take it up to scale. So this is the challenge. I think if, if the industry has a top-down vision of that, you know, let's make focus group and let's use persona to figure out what would be the nice vehicle of tomorrow. This is not going to happen. We're going to end up with vehicles which are highly inefficient because they will pack tons of stuff that actually people don't need on a day-to-day -day basis. You need to find ways for people to see uh, mobility as a continuum. But that means also to have the business models that come with it because it probably means not just what we're using nowadays where you actually sell a car and people keep it or you lease a car and so on and so forth. So the, the brains are there. I think you know, the past few decades have shown us that if you leave it to collective intelligence, uh, very interesting things are happening. But again, at the end of the day, you need the industry to make it happen because we're not talking about digital stuff here. We're talking about, you know, things that need to be manufactured. Two, two examples, uh, maybe. Um, you know, we had uh, the yellow jackets in France. And, um, and what was, in fact, the main issue for, for these people? Their fixed costs um, increased very much. So that the available cash at the end of the month was significantly reduced. Yeah? So maybe we have also to find business models which are protecting their available cash with flexibility. Uh, I think it's no more acceptable for people to have, a frozen function, uh, have frozen functionalities in the vehicle from day one until the last day. They want to have something which is progressively tuned and adapted. Take another example, the boot. Um, you are not using it most of the time. 80% of your time, you are not using it. But when you use it, it's too small. Yeah? Can we think differently the interior of a vehicle? Where, you know, we will have this capacity to adapt uh, to the use cases. And I believe, yes, there are possibilities. And our Lumiere, our uh, here demonstrator, is showing how we could, uh, we could do it. Yeah. So we have plenty of situations of this kind um, which are known by all of us, which are annoying uh, and which we could tackle easily. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you.